the theme of giving a voice is really intricate to my line of work. As a physician, I have the honor and the great responsibility to deliver women and babies. Twelve weeks ago, <laughs> I lived through the most extraordinary delivery of my life. <laughs> this time, the patient was my wife, and the baby I delivered was this little guy, whom I get to bring home now and call my son. I want you to think for a moment. <laughs> I want you to think for a moment of all the children in your life, whether they're yours, whether it's your nephews, and nieces, or cousins. I'm told this is what I'm supposed to expect in a couple of months, but we'll see. How they make you feel, who they are, and how they are. You see, that intensity of that feeling that you have when you think about the children in your life, it allows you to think about what your future will be like when you yourself become a parent, or an uncle, or an aunt. And in this sense, life is very well made. Because the goal of, or the objective of evolution, if you will, is the perpetuation of the species, to give, literally, a voice to the next generation. <laughs> now imagine for a moment that you weren't able to conceive. That forces outside of your control deny you that feeling that you've aspired to for most of your life. It is a known fact that 20% of us will have some problem in achieving conception. That means that one out of every five of us will need some form of medical assistance to become parents. As if the devastating diagnosis wasn't enough, research has consistently shown that pick couples that struggle with infertility experience higher rates of social isolation and stigma than their fertile counterparts. And while most of us only find out that there is a problem, after we try for a year to become pregnant and can't, there's a very specific group of individuals that know from very early on in their life that they will not be able to become parents, at least not in the traditional way. If you'll allow me, I'd like to tell you a little story of one of such patients. As a former medical student here at McGill, I was doing my obstetrics rotation. Obstetrics, we deal with pregnancy and childbirth. And I was asked to see a patient that had delivered, I think it was eight weeks prior. We call these the postpartum visit, postpartum meaning after delivery. And I have to tell you, even to this day, those visits are my favorite visits. Usually, we have the mom who's exhausted and looking like she hasn't slept in about two months, which is often the case. <laughs> but she has that feeling, that joy that just seeps from her being, that is so moving. It's the energy of, of motherhood. But perhaps the most amazing feeling comes from looking at the baby. The baby who is usually sitting in a car seat, quiet, sleeping most of the time. And just looking in the direction of the baby actually reinforces the idea that the true miracles of life are really pregnancy and childbirth. This time, however, it was different. I opened the door to the office and I found that the baby was actually quite awake and looking at the lights, smiling at times, mesmerized. But the mom was crying quite unexpectedly. I put my hand on her shoulder without saying even a word and I handed her a box of tissues. I gave her the time and the space to experience her grief in whatever capacity she felt she needed to. It was clear that something was wrong though. I opened the chart and I looked at the, at the history uh, the medical history of the patient, only to find out that there had been some complications during delivery. And though we had managed to save the baby's life, the patient had lost her uterus during delivery. Now, the uterus is this 
magical organ that actually allows, that serves two main purposes in life. The first purpose is its lining is shed every month when uh, a woman has her menstruation. But the most sort of interesting, if you will, of uh, the role of the uterus is to hold literally life within it. It offers a protective environment for the pregnancy to develop in and to prepare it for delivery. For those of you that may have not heard of what the uterus is itself, it's also known as the womb, as the oven, like in the bun in the oven, <laughs> as the pregnancy belly, basically, that's what you're looking at. Now, I have to tell you, as you can imagine, no oven means no bun. This patient actually had 14 siblings at home. She was the youngest. And she had grown up surrounded by kids all throughout her life. So the idea that she was never going to be able to have any kids anymore was crushing and devastating. A lesser known fact is that there's about three to five of every thousand women are actually born without a uterus. That many more actually, just like this patient, lose their uterus during their reproductive age before they've actually completed their families. Back in the day, and even still today in fact, when these people, when these women want to become parents, the only alternative that exists are adoption and gestational surrogacy, which is basically when you give your embryo to somebody and they carry the pregnancy for you. This is rare and expensive, but this is really the only thing we were able to offer women until very recently. As the women calmed down and she regained her posture, her voice, she asked me one question that would forever change my life. She said, Why can't you give me somebody else's uterus? So my sister's not using hers anymore. I looked at her in sheer disbelief. <laughs> I, you must understand, I was still a young medical student. I hadn't really experienced, I guess, medicine all that much. I had heard of the heart being transplanted, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver. But the uterus? No. And in fact, to be fair though, if chicken soup and Tylenol couldn't take care of your problem, it was already beyond my expertise at that point. <laughs> so I kind of looked at her, like I said, in sheer disbelief, and we finished our encounter. I went home that day thinking about this idea. I was mesmerized by the idea of potentially transplanting the womb. I looked up in the medical literature to see what had been done, and in fact, some people had thought of this prior. And there had been a lot of animal trials that had actually shown some success, but it had never really been tried in a human being. The International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, which is the governing body for OBGYNs all over the world, actually come out with a statement saying that the procedure was unethical because there was no data that showed it to be successful and that it put the person donating their uterus at an unnecessary risk. Okay, getting sort of stuck now here for a moment, and then I continue reading the document only to realize that nothing was ever going to happen regarding uterine transplants unless an ethical framework would actually be developed to fill the gap between animal research and the human application. And so I raised my hand and I said, okay, I want. <laughs> the next day, I went to look for a supervisor. That's what we used to do in medical school. I was clearly naive and inexperienced, and apparently it showed, <laughs> because it did not go very well. And in fact, some of the rejections that I heard were quite amusing. One staff said, 
so let me get this straight. Says you want to give a woman somebody else's uterus so she can have somebody else's period? <laughs> I said, you missed the point. <laughs> That's not what it is. <laughs> somebody else told me, you know, I have a clinic full of women that want to get rid of the uterus, and here you are telling them you want to give them you want? That's not going to fly. <laughs> the last one, which I really never forgot about, but I, I came to a staff that was you know, quite well established, and I, and I told him about this idea, and he said, you haven't met my research nurse, have you? I said, no. He says, make sure you wear protective gear when you tell her about this. <laughs> All right. With a crushed ego, but really, again, with that sort of stubbornness that comes from being inexperienced and naive, I went to the next group of professionals that might be interested in this, my fellow medical students. The response this time was massive. If not to create some sort of ethical framework, it was more to learn more about this procedure. The idea of potentially contributing to this debate at the international stage was just appealing enough that, again, other naive and inexperienced people like myself would be want to join, would want to join into the, into the endeavor. I found uh, fellow medical students that had interest similar to mine in ethics and reproductive medicine and surgical innovation. And after months of researching interesting questions, some of which I'll share with you today, I think you can understand why that would be an ethical concern when you want to address giving somebody a new womb. For example, why would you put somebody under surgery, under anesthesia, put them through all that risk if they can actually maybe adopt or have a surrogate for much less risk? At the same time, you can ask the question, well, why would you spend so much money and resources for a procedure when even the organ you're actually transplanting is not even life-saving? You understand that means that you, you couldn't live without a heart, but you can very well live without a uterus. These kinds of questions really kept us up as we developed our framework. We spoke with research teams all over the world. We spoke with ethicists all over the world. And six months after this, we developed the Montreal Criteria for the Ethical Feasibility of Uterine Transplantation. Now, this is, to those of you that are not in science, this might not seem like a lot. But when you publish in a medical journal without a degree, because we didn't have any degrees, <laughs> and when you publish as belonging to a faculty because you don't have any departments, <laughs> it's not so simple. It took a while. But we managed it. And so what are the Montreal criteria? The Montreal, the Montreal criteria actually served a specific set of conditions that had to be met by the donor, the recipient, and the healthcare team performing the transplant in order to consider the whole endeavor as ethical. Here, too, the response was massive. We were getting invitations to, 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 invitations to, to assist in documentaries, press releases, editorial write-ups, teams that wanted to contribute with us. And again, we were, understandably so, very overwhelmed. I'd like to leave you with a few of the questions that I think will make you wonder just a little bit about the potential that this might have if it's to be, again, accepted in society. I am proud to share with you that since the inception of the Montreal Criteria, over 40 uterine transplants have taken place all over the world. 10 pregnancies have been confirmed. And about a handful of babies, okay, maybe not walking around yet, but they're crawling. <laughs> and they have made medical history in the way that they were born. Just see this? This is sort of a, a, a little video of the procedure. I'll talk to you through it uh, because it's a bit technical, but it's just basically in a way in which we take the uterus from the donor, where we cut to make the incisions for the vessels. 
and then you'll see in a, in a minute or so how the, uh, the organ is actually transplanted into the recipient. Some of the interesting things uh, that I want you to think about, again, even if you're not, uh, you don't have a science background or a medical background, is <coughs> when we transplant the organ, we transplant the organ itself, okay, the, the, the pregnancy belly, if you will, the womb, and the vessels that feed it with the blood supply. What we don't transplant, though, is the nerves that are associated with the uterus. And these are the same nerves, ladies, that give you menstrual cramps and they give you contractions when you're in labor. Now, that sounds like a paradise. <laughs> but if you think about it, when you have a uterus whose goal is to actually host a pregnancy, not having nerves also means not feeling the baby move, okay? which is one of the most precious, I guess, experiences of pregnancy. Is it then ethical to do something to achieve a pregnancy if the pregnancy itself is not ethical? It's not difficult, excuse me. At the same time, there are risks that are associated with a transplanted organ where you have to take anti-rejection medication for a long time. Taking that anti-rejection medication to avoid, to prevent your immune system from rejecting the organ can actually lead you to have medical problems if you take it for a long time. Such would be the case for a kidney or liver or a heart, which you keep with you till the day that you pass. This particular transplant, if you think about it, once you're done having your pregnancies, you remove it. And then you avoid the need to have anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life. In this sense, the uterine transplant is the only tra transient transplant in the history of medicine. At the same time, there are benefits to the donor, the person giving the uterus. Not only are you making somebody very happy, but you're also removing your uterus, and so you were preventing any chance of having uterine cancer later on in life. The most interesting thing for me, though, and I'll leave you with this, are two potential situations or scenarios when you talk about transplanting a uterus. Imagine. Well, uh, when you transplant an organ, you obviously have to have some form of genetic compatibility. So what do we do? We look usually for family members first. Often, obviously in this case, we can only look for women. And so often we'll look at the mother whose daughter was born without a uterus. So the mother can give her uterus to her own daughter. If that daughter then goes to have a pregnancy of her own in that uterus, it means that her baby will develop in the same womb as she herself did. What kind of implications it might, this might have, again, psychologically later, it's still unknown. But perhaps the most interesting thing has to do with the potential of having men walking around with a uterus and walking around with a pregnancy. This is physiologically possible, it hasn't happened just yet. So if I can leave you with a, with a take home message here, it is when your gut tells you that something is worth pursuing, go ahead and do it. And hey, if you don't like that take home message, tell your friends tomorrow there might be a man walking around with a pregnancy in 10 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>